so yeah, as you can see, uh, these are the whole, everyone on the stage right now is a current or former uh, technical steering committee member. Um, so we're gonna kind of get into uh, what the technical steering committee does, um, what's it all about. Um, so, uh, and we have uh, everyone I think you've seen up here uh, before on the stage today, we have uh, Lee Kuei and Michael, but we also have Rob Richard up here as well, all technical steering committee members. Um, so first off, we're gonna start off easy, we'll get into spicier stuff later. <laughs> um, but uh, first question, what, does the, what is the technical steering committee for GraphQL, what does it do? Um, I'll let Lee take the first question. Um, thank you. So the technical steering committee, you've heard from a couple of folks doing talks. They're, we can talk about what they're responsible for, and then we can talk about what they do. Um, the GraphQL Foundation is essentially like a, it's like a guiding set of documents that describe how we work, how we make sure all the work we do stays in the open, and the, the TSC are essentially the stewards of that. So they make sure that our projects are run in an open way, that our repositories stay up to date, that we have people on top of them to make sure that things are getting merged, and in the rare case where there's disagreement, the TSC members have to be the adult in the room and come in and figure out a way for us to back away from whatever it is that we've gotten tangled up in and come to a consensus. But then you can see what they do, which is we've expanded these working groups, which are open meetings that anyone can join, to all these subcommittee working groups that are working on all these projects. So anyone can, of course, run those, but in practice, the TSC members are usually um, not because they are the TSC, but they become the TSC because they are the folks who drive those kinds of projects. So you'll often find the TSC members as sort of the most knowledgeable um, and the leaders of a lot of the most important projects that we're working on. Yeah, so it sounds, it sounds like a pretty important job. Um, so we'll get into uh, one of the other questions, which is uh, why, why is the TSC important? Why do we need a technical steering committee for GraphQL? Um, so maybe, uh, Michael, do you wanna take that one? Yeah, so um, you need people that really pick up the work uh, and feel responsible for the different pieces of the graphical ecosystem. Uh, if you didn't have the TSC, then a lot would just uh, stay where it is and not move forward. So really the TSC drives these things, organizes these things. Um, for instance, Benji, also one of our TSCs, he organizes a lot of the um, working group meetings and there goes really a lot of work into like uh, making sure that their notes are taken or that the videos are uploaded from each of our working groups. Like uh, basically we do all the works behind the scene of the GraphQL uh, project. So I don't know if anyone else wants to chime in a little bit for any, okay, well, we'll move on. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> I was like, it's important, he got it. Um, yeah, so uh, this is kind of um, like another question is like, uh, like do you, I mean, you can join the TSC, how does, how does that happen? How do you become a, a TSC member? And I, you know, this is kind of a loaded question, but uh, do you enjoy being a, a TSC member? So um, maybe uh, Kuei, do you wanna take that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so um, I think being a TSC member is definitely one of uh, the best choice I've, I've made, uh, to be honest. So uh, as you kind of mentioned, we, we, we didn't start being the TSC members, we started contributing to the, the, to the committee uh, in the language spec. And to be honest, like, us as software engineers, not all of us have the muscle to design the language spec and to have someone like from the TSE member to hold your hands to guide you uh, and then like to walk through that process was really helpful and now like kind of seeing the value of the, how the TSE members helped me um, and becoming a TSE member, uh, every month we really solve one of the kind of the interesting questions uh, of, of language design, how do we evolve them, uh, that was really, really rewarding for me. So definitely enjoy it a lot. Amazing. Um, anyone else wanna chime in if, okay. Oh? Go back. <laughs> what, oh yeah. Okay, we, we can move on. If, okay. okay. Um, 20 questions. I'm looking for bright eyes, just in case anyone has anything else to say. Um, <laughs> cool. Um, so then, uh, Rob, I, I saw you looking over at me, so I'm going to give you the hardest question. Um, what does the future of GraphQL look like? But we can, we can let other people chime yeah. in, too. I mean, I what think that, th that we saw a lot of stuff today uh, about composite schemas. Um, there's also really exciting things about nullability going on in the working group meetings. Um, I have been working on Defer and Stream Really excited about that. And I think that we've been making a lot of progress in all of these and some good stuff coming up. Yeah, 
amazing. Um, yeah, I, I also can say that you can see like that GraphQL is moving from these early startup companies really to enterprises. So if we talk about the future of GraphQL, it becomes more and more an aggregation layer for data uh, by larger companies. And uh, that's a bit uh, a shift that you can see from we uh, are the solution for just mobile applications. We still are that, right? <laughs> but uh, now they are coming these bigger enterprise uh, players in and using GraphQL for a whole new set of um, uh, set of problems. So this is um, one of the things where it's moving. Yeah. GraphQL lives in this, and many projects like it, live in this necessary tension between we heard Yuri talking about the thing that people were asking from him wasn't like a laundry list of features. It was stability. Make your project stable. Make it predictable. Make it interchangeable. And uh, that's what a lot of, if you're using this for something real, real big with a lot of customers on top of it, you want to know that it's dependable and that uh, one of our friendly faces up here won't you know, merge a PR that breaks your entire stack. So um, we have to live in the world of careful, thoughtful evolution with a focus on kind of not changing things, right? We, we try to keep things as stable as possible. We put a lot of work into thinking about how not to break existing use cases, even if it forces us down a language decision path that we might not necessarily choose from scratch, while also balancing that this project is alive. As people use it more, they encounter new kinds of ways that they want to use it, new frustration points that we want to solve for. So it also has to evolve. We have to do both evolution and introduction of new capabilities while simultaneously allowing it to stay stable, which is a super interesting and, and tough design challenge and uh, a lot of what this group's working all the time. Amazing, yeah. It seems like um, it's kind of crazy since uh, GraphQL started. It's changed a lot and it's evolved a lot, um, but even in the past few years, it's, it really kind of changes and evolves on it and it kind of highlights how important having a technical steering committee is, especially now as like things are changing. There's a bunch more people involved and everything. Um, so what are kind of some of the main topics of discussion at the working group you know, and, and kind of how that relates to the TSC and what, is, what are folks excited about? Um, maybe we'll start with go on the end we All can right. go down or okay. what are, what's everyone excited about? Yeah, so there are actually a lot of uh, things being discussed uh, in the working group. Sometimes from, from afar it looks as, as if we are not moving, but there are so many discussions around uh, semantic non-null, uh, which we called before CCN, like uh, client control nullability. It takes time for these topics to evolve. But like there's a lot of new stuff coming to the GraphQL Foundation. Some pieces of these new pieces Lee actually talked about in 2016 already, <laughs> but they are still coming. Uh, so uh, I would say semantic non-null, different stream, and um, a ton of other things like the composite schema working group and stuff like that. Yeah, I think you pretty much uh, covered all of the uh, major ones. Maybe we can um, kind of follow up with what I, uh, we all feel most excited about or controversial. Uh, I think nullability is definitely one of the, the things a lot of people, I think it's actually the most interesting and most controversial in my opinion. Controversial not in the sense that why are you raising this? Controversial in the sense that we all want it, but probably everybody want a different flavor of it. So which version makes it into the final spec is what we have been like discussing a lot. Um, and for me, I remember at least three different proposals with some at catch, with some of the shebang version, like all in discussion and that's like, kind of the, the beauty of it, right? Like we need to make it right, yeah. Yeah, and, and I've, I've been working on Deferrent Stream for a long time, uh, kind of over the past year or so, like we've been going down in one direction for a while, decided to take a step back, look at different trade-offs and evolve it before we move forward. And so uh, I'm talking about that tomorrow. And so, yeah. Um, I'll give the meta answer on what I'm excited about, which is getting to work with a set of dedicated, super smart people. Um, that's the thing that I'm most excited about. I usually show up to these working groups, and I uh, only very occasionally have something that I'm actually championing. Usually I'm, I'm showing up and giving advice or helping try to, to drive things through. And uh, each of the fine folks, both here and uh, the others that you've seen stand up, 
um, put a, a mountain of work into this project, and uh, they don't have to, um, and yet they do it because it's interesting and they care, um, and some of them have stuck around for many years. So um, every time I show up, it's like getting to, getting to work with this team is just so fun. So that's the thing I'm always excited about. Amazing. Um, okay, so those are the easy questions. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. So, uh, so now we're going to get into some spicier questions, so stick around. Um, so first off, um, why does GraphQL progress seem so slow? Um, maybe, I don't know, we can, we can start with Lee on this one. Yeah, uh, I can take one. some blame for that. <laughs> so I mean, certainly some of this goes back to um, wanting to keep things stable. So sometimes the first idea off of our heads just totally breaks GraphQL in a way that we just can't do it and we spend the first um, couple revs at design and figuring out what's a version of this that doesn't break GraphQL. And then we don't like it and we're like, ah, but this is, we're, we'd feel really ashamed, like we couldn't you know, stand up in front of people or you know, write documentation about how we feel good about this design path. And then we back up again and say, well, what are we really trying to do here exactly? What's a problem we're trying to solve? And sometimes it throws us in circles. It takes a while. And we'll eventually get to, you mentioned the nullability one of um, some of these things come down to kind of technical taste. Uh, and some of them come down to realizing that there's an ecosystem of related problems that are in tension with one another and we have to figure out how to resolve. So like, what's our opinion on the matter? And, and that takes some time to figure out as well. Um, and then, you know, to be honest, this is hard, like it's hard. And, uh, and the people who do this are volunteers and they, they show up, they're like, ah, I wish GraphQL did this. And I say, great, like come be the champion for that change, show up, show up to the meeting, you can come. And they show up and they have like slides ready and some example code and they're like, so, can I merge it? And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. <laughs> you know, thank you for starting the conversation. This is super exciting. I'm very excited to have you come back you know, every month with updates on progress. And they go, yeah, I'm excited. And they come back a little bit. And then they, uh, some people follow through. And they ship stuff. And it lands. And we move GraphQL forward. And others realize that it's sometimes a bit of a Sisyphusian, is that the right word, task right, to get these things done. Um, and a lot of the projects, even the ones that we've all said that we're very excited about, have changed hands between the very folks on the stage or others that you've seen stand up, sort of get it to the state where they say, okay, I would like to hand this to somebody else to be the champion because they're fired up and I need a break um, because it's hard work. So that's part of the reason why it's slow. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and even if um, the, even if your first idea doesn't break all of GraphQL <laughs> and you do, you have to be really careful because once it is in the spec, then everyone is going to be using it and then you can't change it anymore after that because then you'll be breaking people. So you have to be really careful. And I, I actually, I disagree with this question. You know, I, I Rejection want- Rejection of the premise, all right. You know, so GraphQL, it is actually a language. I understand we're not Turing complete, but we're still a language. So not to name names, but comparing to other language design committees, we actually move reasonably fast. Okay, so I mean, just to like compare it to, to, to what you compare. If you compare it to just a general project, sure, like we might be moving slower. But if you compare it to other kind of language design, like think about common languages and how often they release their major versions, I, I do think we move relatively fast in, in that sense. And you have to accept that GraphQL is a DSL, right? It is a language. And we do have to be careful. We do have to think about those meta programming questions. Is that your, it's not a concrete project. It's a project for different projects. So uh, those ap aspects, I guess, uh, will we'll make it slower. But actually, pretty reasonable speed. Yeah. yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, especially if you look what is in the, in the various stages, so in the pipeline, it looks actually uh, quite a lot. There's quite a lot of change coming, slowly. But, <laughs> <laughs> but reasonable. <Yeah. laughs> Yeah, it, it's kind of funny, you know, to, to have something like GraphQL that's so, you know, it's, it's really easy to use and that's kind of like one of its selling points. It's like, look at how awesome this is and what you can do with it. But to, to make something, you know, the way it is like that, it, there's a lot of work and you have to make sure that everything is kind of just right because if it isn't, then you end up with something that isn't as easy to use and isn't as like awesome as it is. So it takes a lot of work, but I agree. I feel like it, uh, things move relatively fast if you compare it to like other such things, you know, in the universe, so. Yeah, there's know. even a proposal from you still somewhere. 
from, from the Twitter time, I remember. The, well, I don't know. I'm not sure what company you're talking about. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, no, there might be some. Um, uh, so we're, we're going to move on to even more spicy questions. Um, and we can, we'll, we can go down the line if you have something to say um, for some of these. So this is, this is kind of an oddball question, but um, will there ever be a GraphQL 2.0? What does that even mean? What, and what would that look like, maybe? So we can start with Lee. Um, funny story, um, you're all using GraphQL 2.0. <laughs> <laughs> um, because GraphQL did not start as a open spec and an open project. It started as an internal project. And um, there was a small number of us who were building it in, was that early 2012? Um, and oh, we were so fired up about that idea. We, we worked on it for, for three years straight um, while we were working at Facebook. And in its first few months, we really we put, we put so much focus on getting the language design right. We made a ton of mistakes, but the, it had a, a pretty good origin. And then you get the thing you get at all companies, where you have some load-bearing technology, and everybody wants one more feature, and one more feature, and one more feature. And if you worked at the, the kind of companies that I work at, then you don't have to ask for permission to do those things. If you want to write code, and someone will you know, hit accept on your, your pull request, you get to change it. And that's what happened to GraphQL. Um, and most of the ideas and the features that were added were awesome. So GraphQL became very powerful. It went from the solving this very narrow problem to solving this broad range of problems. And then um, the Relay team <laughs> said, we should open source GraphQL. And I said, this mess? You want to open source this mess? Uh, what would it even look like? And so I, I said, OK, but I will open source it, but only if I can rewrite it from scratch. And they're like, what? <laughs> so um, we, we did a whole exercise. It took many months. And it was essentially the proto-TSC. I anointed a handful of my, my coworkers at Facebook at the time to be reviewers. Everything sort of went through change by change. I'm proposing this change. Here's what it changes. Here's why. Here's the motivating principle. Um, and we had a, a kind of a suite of those. And this is an internal project. And it yielded something that um, felt a little bit more consistent and coherent. And that is what we open sourced. So that was GraphQL version 2. And um, folks who still work at Facebook may see remnants of GraphQL v1 still sticking around. Probably to this day. <laughs> you can tell me if some yeah, of them are still um, around. I think the, the world will thank you because the initial version is called SuperGraph. So thank you so yeah. much for naming it like such a cool name for the world that we're not calling it super you can, Yeah, I think you can thank Nick Schrock for the name, okay. to be clear. I, uh, such a he's, better name. He's yeah. a bit of a better name. Um, but it's, OK, so we were talking about changing things. And um, Rob, you made the good point that even for something that feels narrow, there's no possible way this could break an existing case. It's just purely an additive change. Well, that's kind of how internally we got to the state where it felt like a mess. So there's like four different interrelated concepts that were visually very different or didn't work in a consistent way. And we needed to back up and sort of like do big major breaking changes in order to get it to something that felt coherent. So um, the goal is to never do, I'll call it GraphQL 3.0, um, which would, I think, be the result of enough, you know, what we would look at as, in hindsight, bad decisions on language uh, choices that later resulted in something that didn't feel like it was easy to learn, didn't feel like it was simple, and instead now felt like you know there's a thousand one concepts you need to figure out in order to use this thing. Then we might all look at that as a as a language steering committee and go, uh oh, do we need to do version three? And there's another language out there that went from version two to version three, which will remain nameless, that um, went very smoothly, and we would not like to do that. Yeah, there's also the question about the cost of change, right? Um, because if you have something like GraphQL. Uh, it would affect so many tools uh, that uh, have to be redone. It's uh, insane. I think 3.0 3 would cost a lot of effort across the whole ecosystem. I almost feel like maybe the, a different way of answering this is maybe 10 years from now when we look back. And then there was a point like, wait, I think this is the point like the next generation of GraphQL actually happened. And I do feel like maybe we already, even in the public version, we do have the 2.0 moment. Personally, for me, that was the federation moment where we kind of 
no, it, it is like for one specific application, but no, you can actually do a lot of the stitching, composition, and that kind of was a moment for me that, oh, this is the next iteration or find the use case of GraphQL. And I do believe uh, something like that will happen in the future for, for us, and then it's only when we look back that we will realize, okay, wait, this is the next iteration. Again, we just, we were, when we were living in the moment, we didn't realize that. You're right. But it, it's, and it's actually, if, if, if semantic non null comes in and uh, defer and stream finally are in, and uh, Benji at some point merges one off, <laughs> so, so. at this moment, we actually have a graph query that will feel vastly different. Yeah, so. in an additive way. Uh, and I always find it fascinating to look at other language communities and seeing how they face this problem. Um, two that I always think are really interesting to think about, uh, one is SQL. So SQL was created much, much older than GraphQL, and people still use it. Um, and there are flavors of SQL. And they all sort of have a common foundation, but you know there's variations and there's some breaking conflict. And you could say maybe that could have been avoided, but maybe that's the necessary consequence of some innovation. But I, I think the SQL space is very interesting. Um, the other one that I find very interesting is C. So C traces back to like the beginnings of like you cannot touch a machine that has not been influenced by C or the people who made C, and it spawns almost all programming languages that you use every day. Um, and C itself still exists. And in fact, I think somewhat recently, there was like, was C23 the most recent one that came out? <laughs> so anyway, there's, there's that la core language community is still developing that project. And yet, there exists C++, which is C and some other things, or C Sharp, which is C and some other things, or Objective-C, which is C and some other things, or JavaScript, which is C-like, but definitely isn't C, but has some overlap. <laughs> um, and I think that's also very interesting. You know, like I don't want to force us down that path anytime in the immediate future. But QA, you made a good point. Like, what does this look like ten years from now? Um, I could certainly imagine a finding that like ten years worth of, you know, industry evolution, ten years worth of GraphQL evolution, that we find ourselves in a spot where it still works great. People still use it, but it kind of feels like C in the sense of if you were going to start a new project from scratch, would you write it in C? In some cases, yes. In all cases, maybe not. You have a lot of choice. Yeah, you would. And that would be really interesting if it sort of like blossomed over time into some other things over the long arc. Yeah, and then you use GraphQL plus plus. And <laughs> <laughs> maybe there'll be better ways for us. I don't know. We don't need to repeat the 80s and 90s. We could find. They didn't have Zoom. That's the difference. <laughs> Okay, so in, in the year you know, 2034, um, I'm gonna be here still, but I'll have like glasses because I'm older, gray hair, and I'll be like, <laughs> uh, GraphQL 3.0, it happened, or whatever. So we'll, we'll check back in like 10 years. Okay, <laughs> yeah, we'll be here. Um, okay, great. Um, cool, so uh, the, these, I think Rob's been ready for these questions, so these are for maybe you. Um, so, and you can pick and choose whichever ones you wanna highlight, but, um, does, and then there's a bunch of stuff like HTTP 2 plus, uh, uh, React server components, TRPC, open API, OData, stuff like that. Um, does any of that eliminate the need for GraphQL? And we'll start with Rob. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, I don't think that GraphQL is appropriate for every single use case. And I think that all these other things are, they could be really cool. There's um, definitely ways to use them. Um, the thing that always has me going back to GraphQL is as a, a front end engineer, there's just the way that with frameworks like Relay, you can have your UI components with GraphQL fragments, compose them all the way up. Um, when I'm working with my teams, that, that works really well for us. It allows like everyone to work on our, our code base. And um, that's, that's one of my favorite GraphQL features. And um, Especially with uh, React server components and a lot of front end frameworks doing stuff on the server, streaming to the client, I think that uh, fits really well with where we're going with defer and stream. And I think that would get us to, uh, that, that, could, that would fit together really nicely. Yeah, I think one thing also where GraphQL is very different is like from the mental model. 
like when we look, for instance, at, at O data or something like this, this is meant from the database layer, whereas GraphQL was thought as a sin layer of your business layer, which gave you the chance to expose that uh, with less friction and also introduced things like fragments to the language. So it's not only um, a query language to query the server, but also has the client in mind. Like you use the fragments, for instance, as um, a primitive for composition in your UI components. So this mix of, okay, this is a way to query your server, but also here are pieces for your uh, for your logical client development that you can incorporate is, I think, what makes GraphQL very different from things like Open API or Data, or, um, maybe not TRP TRPC, but that's a special child. Yeah. <laughs> I would say, I think, Rob, you kind of touch upon this is like, all of these are valid choices, right? Like, so when you start a new project, feel free to shop around. But uh, at the end of the day, you'll realize GraphQL is the best. So please, yes. uh, just joke, jokes aside, I, I do. I do think like you feel free to to, to look around. And for us as uh, uh, the, the maintainers of community, which is everybody here, uh, it, it's it's good that you can look at what other implementations are and how good they are. Like what what are like some of the things you wish GraphQL have as well, and kind of like also bringing it back to GraphQL. Uh, I think it's a like a healthy way of continue to evolve the the ecosystem as well. I'm so excited all these projects exist. Um, one, it kind of validates the problem that GraphQL sought to solve. Because if GraphQL is the only way that you can address that problem, oh boy, that's not good. Uh, because everyone's projects look different. They have different flavors of that problem. They have different environments. And uh, the fact that there's now more and more technologies that are trying to address the problem of how do you build products, digital products, that feel good, that need to interact with richer and richer data layers in ways that don't become aggressively coupled. That's really hard. And um, that was a problem that we faced that led to the decision that we needed to build something like GraphQL in the first place. And one of the things that I observed, thinking back to my like hype cycle wave graph, <laughs> is um, when GraphQL was, was first open sourced, I had a lot of really enthusiastic people, some of whom stuck around and are <laughs> here, it's going like, ah, yes, I have that problem too. And this is very exciting. I'm excited to try and see if this solves it for me. And the answer was, it kind of did. In a narrow set, if, the, if their use case looked similar-ish to what we were using it for at Facebook at the time, they were very happy. And they started building out a bunch of ecosystem tools. If the use case looked a little bit different, GraphQL started like bending and stretching at the bounds to cover surface area that it was never totally intended to cover. Now, some of those have panned out. They've, they've now become core, you know, part of the core surface area of a problem that GraphQL can address. And others have been a bit of a retreat. You try to use it in various ways, and it doesn't quite work. And you could try to amend the language to cover more cases, or you could retreat and say, that's surface area for a different technology to solve, which I think is very good, because it helps us narrow what exactly is the problem that we are trying to solve, and can we focus our language design on that particular one, instead of trying to be all things to all people. Um, and so I'm, I'm very excited all these other projects exist, so that there are, of course, going to be many ways in which they overlap, where you could choose either, and you'll find trade-offs. There are many ways in which they compose, where you use them together, and you can get benefits of both. And then there's many in which that they don't overlap. And actually, one will be kind of definitively a better choice than another. And GraphQL gets to seat at the table and gets to play in the ecosystem. I think it's very cool. Yeah. Um, so I think we have time for one more question. This is the hardest question. Um, so is, do, do we think that GraphQL is still relevant? Veto the question. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, veto the question, of course. Next question. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so maybe we can go down the line, but you know, briefly, I suppose. Uh, is GraphQL still relevant? Uh, I feel like we think it is, but Lee, let's start with you. Um, the, the reason why I know that it is still relevant is I will occasionally, so I, I would, actually, I'm curious, maybe show of hands. How many people's day job, your like primary lingua franca that you write code in every day is Swift, Objective-C, Kotlin, or, or specifically Java that runs on Android phones? You, you build for mobile devices. 
Okay. <laughs> I, I see maybe a dozen hands. This is fascinating to me because that is the audience that we built GraphQL for. And um, the fact that we've shifted to cover a much, much broader set of folks is one sense of the rel that relevance. But sometimes I think, were we aiming at the wrong initial audience and we've moved to a different one? Uh, and I will occasionally talk to somebody who is a mobile engineer who will either has started to adopt GraphQL and they're like, oh my gosh, what, how have I not done this sooner? Or is describing their problem and I get to tell them about GraphQL. And it's like the deja vu moment all over again where you know, here we are like almost you know, well over 10 years later and it's the exact same problem. <laughs> the, our tools have gotten better, our languages have improved, but the exact same problem of how do you ship code that you can never take back, because once they've installed a binary on their device, you can't take it back, that talks to your servers that you never want to break, that you want to keep isolated from your business logic, but you can give them sort of a semantic layer to query it, where you don't have to have crazy access patterns, where you can be conscious of latency, you can be contra conscious of uh, sort of waterfall data access patterns. And uh, there's still just, there aren't that many tools that address that as like a complete suite. And it, it, I think it's just always fascinating every time I encounter a mobile engineer who's adopting GraphQL, and I'm like, ah, yes. <laughs> My original use case is <laughs> still as relevant now as it was in 2012. Um, so that makes me happy. Right. Uh, I guess I would say as long as we still need API design, which I think we always will, no matter what kind of application we build, GraphQL is that, and it will kind of always be relevant. Yeah. Yes, yes and yes. I agree. Okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> all right. Um, cool. I think that's all the time we have. Thank you to our amazing panelists here. <laughs> <laughs>